Fire and Emergency Services Instructor, 8th Edition, Chapter 6, Classroom Instruction, Part 3. Gifted students demonstrate achievement or potential ability in one or more of five areas. The visual and performing arts, general intellectual ability, specific academic aptitude, creative or productive thinking, and leadership ability. So as far as you're gifted in visual and performing arts, where would you kind of tap those students throughout the class? What do you want them doing? Hands-on, okay. They're likely to be able to uh, role play things a lot better than some other folks are. So when you're setting up a role play, kind of have them take the lead and do it. Specific academic aptitude towards the material towards the study method, all that good stuff. Creative or productive thinking. You want people that can think outside the box. Adapt, overcome. And then you have students that have general leadership ability to be able to help push the class forward. You should be careful when categorizing a student as slow. There are a few other reasons that students have difficulty understanding. They have physical disabilities. They have learning disabilities, they have low literacy abilities, and they have a lack of language proficiency. So be careful when you're putting students into a category because that may not turn out to be the case. Know the methods to assist a slow student. Private conferences. Pull them off one by one to the side, have a discussion with them, make sure they're getting everything they need out of the course. Give them special assignments adapted specifically to them. Give them different types of study assignments so they'll be able to figure things out. Or give them individual instruction to help them through the class that they're having issues with. Morning, Joby. Good morning. <laughs> Non-disruptive, non-participating students are timid or introverted and appear to be uninterested. So you've got this graphic here up and down showing certain push points. You've got students that are shy or timid that are not going to be dis non-disruptive, non-participating. And then you have those students that are bored or uninterested, and you're going to need to pull them in and get them engaged in the class to make sure they're learning as well. If you don't take care of it, those bored or uninterested students are likely to derail your entire class and cause problems for everyone else. So be aware of that. Disruptive, non-participating students act in a way inappropriate for a classroom or a training setting. They can be talkative and aggressive, or they can just in general be show-off. But you've got to make sure that you take steps to minimize that. Pull them into the class. Ask them direct questions. Ask them rhetorical questions. If that doesn't work, then you'll probably have to have a one-on-one -on -one conference with them or perhaps a conference with their chief as well to get them involved and engaged. I wouldn't go as far as discussing specific things as far as the Buckley Law is concerned, but I would have a conversation with that individual's chief and say, hey, look, we're having, we, we seem to have a disconnect here. We need to fix it. Non-disruptive, participating, successful students actively engage in the learning process. They may be overlooked, causing them to become frustrated with the instructor, their classmates, or the course. Involve them in class activities. Enlist their assistance through peer teaching or mentoring. So what are some individual student needs an instructor may face in the classroom? Private conferences. Jeff? Special assignments. 
Special assignments for the slower learners. Thank you, Leah. What was that, Kevin? Even individual instruction. Good, good. Let's discuss the student's substantive rights. Students should have equal access to fundamental rights and privileges. The privacy of their records and test scores. So I'm not going to discuss Jeff's progress with Kevin, and I'm not going to discuss Kevin's progress with the rest of the class. So I may make some overview comments as far as everyone's doing good, we're having some issues with this particular point, this particular point, this particular point, but you have to make sure their records and test scores are secured. Make sure you're keeping track of your gradebook. If you're using an electronic gradebook, then make sure that students only have access to the student portions and not to other students' information. They should have the freedom to express an opinion different from the organization. Just because the officers say one thing is true does not mean that you have to block those opinions from your class. In fact, you should encourage them. Because sometimes the status quo is not really the right way to go, especially with the fire service. They have to have equal access to the learning environment. So again, we go back to the webinar, we go back to the YouTube stream, we go back to everything else. All students should have equal access to come in and learn. They should have fair and equal treatment in class. You have to treat all students equally and fairly across the entire class, no matter, it, no matter what the conditions, no matter what's going on. And then you have to create a non-hostile learning environment. So when we talk about a hostile learning environment, what do you guys think that means? What, what, what would you have in a, in a hostile learning environment? Bullying. Bullying? <laughs> Jeff? Okay. That's a big one. Sexual and other forms of harassment. If you've got a female in the class, you have to make sure that she's not being harassed through comments and things like that. It's generally a good idea to make sure that questions that are, not questions, but things that are inappropriate for the class are taken care of right away. Uh, we go back to the four examples in chapter one as far as student interaction off the clock, outside of class. Um, you have to cut those things down and make sure that they're not happening in your class. If they do, then you need to get your supervisor involved and make sure you take quick and decisive action to preserve that non-hostile learning environment. No students' rights. Rules and regulations must be consistently applied to all situations and students. Reasonable regulations are necessary to protect students during training activities. And the organizations may have regulations that students perceive as unreasonable. That comes back on you as the instructor to give them the knowledge, to give them the information of why we have to use the spotter when we're backing into the station or why we don't allow smoking or vaping during in the training room during the training evolutions. So make sure you discuss those things with your students. <clears throat> what rights does a student have? Privacy of records and test scores? Equal access to the learning environment? Fair and equal treatment in the class? Non-hostile classroom? Safe learning environment? All right, moving on. Let's describe techniques used to manage student behavior in the classroom. Managing student behavior is one of the instructor's most important skills. You have to review policies with them. You have to be a bit of a coach and a counselor to help them continue to move forward. Uh, you can provide them peer assistance or mentoring put them with a student that has a little bit more grasp on the program, help that student mentor, and you have to control disruptive behavior. 
Review the rules, regulations, and policies of the training division with students. You have to address these concerns. Safety rules, attendance and tardiness, responding to emergencies from class, the level of expected class participation, the methods of evaluation, the assignment due dates, cancellations due to the weather or other causes, student parking, dress and grooming, and breaks or rest periods. Counseling helps the student to adjust, redirect behavior, or eliminate barriers to learning. These are all actions you can take. You can give them advice. You can have discussions with them. You can give them tests that identify the problem areas. And you provide vocational assistance. Why do we have tests and quizzes in this class? See where we're having issues? Figure out where we need to study more? Okay. Make sure people are absorbing the material. Yes, Leah, that's good. That works. <coughs> know the guidelines for counseling a student. Meet and talk with the student. List the exact facts on the form of what behavior the individual is displaying. We recommend that any time you coach or counsel a student, it's written down in writing to make sure that the student understands exactly what you're saying and to make sure you understand the student's point of view. State objectives that communicate what is expected of the student. We go back to job performance requirements and specific parts of the NFPA standard. Identify those and make sure they know what you expect. And then discuss the issue with the student and agree upon solutions to the various problems they may be having. Explain what actions will be taken if the student does not comply with the objectives and solutions. Have the student sign the form. Give a copy of the form to the student and retain the original. Forward a copy of the form to the training institution or forward a copy of the form to the student supervisor. Make sure you take all these steps because that will, is what's going to save you when that student comes back three years later and says, well, I didn't learn too much from Lieutenant Cook, and this is why. Because he was mean to me, and he was unfair to me, so on and so forth. Make sure you have it in writing and make sure you carbon copy the training institution and the student supervisor so they understand what's going on. Coaching. Giving motivational correction, positive reinforcement, and constructive feedback. The formal coaching model. Describe the current level of the performance. Describe the desired level of performance. Again, going back, looking at the JPRs, making sure that you've communicated them and they understand them. Obtain a commitment for change and follow up on that commitment. No peer assistance. <clears throat> a peer is someone who is equal in status, either socially or professionally, and it involves having students help each other in the learning process. Go back to the first day of class. We assigned you guys to squads, and I told you specifically, make sure that you're handling information in the squad before you come to someone in the instructor pool to make sure that you're reaching out to the resources in your own group. Mentoring occurs with someone other than the instructor who guides student actions and real experiences. Mentors serve as role models. They provide guidance. They gain specialized training. They provide outside resources. They provide challenging work. And they monitor your achievement or the, the student's achievements, rather. No student-originated disruptions. Arriving late. Speaking at inappropriate times. Talking about unrelated topics. Sleeping in class accompanied by snoring. 
showing off, interrupting others, sidetracking discussions, acting blatantly insubordinate and disrespectful. You'll see these in class. So make sure you take the time to document the document what's happening factually, not emotionally, factually, and then provide that information to the student so they understand what the what the exact expectations of them are. Let's talk about instructor caused disruptive behavior. As the instructor, if you do these three things or the things following on the slides, you are the problem. We don't intimidate students. We don't show our impatience with students. We don't have a lack of preparation. You have to make sure that you are prepared every time you walk into the classroom and start teaching. Student caused disruptive behavior. Previous experience may have prepared students to react inappropriately. Students may not understand why they must attend the class. They may enjoy displaying their knowledge at the expense of the instructor. Or they may want or need attention and they use disruptive behavior to gain it. All factors in play that you guys will see in the classroom. Know the suggestions for dealing with students who feel superior. Show your confidence in your role as the content expert. Get questions answered. Respond to the student, but continue to manage class time. Always smile. Do not embarrass students. Avoid getting into a battle with them. And make sure that you understand that their questions have merit. A student who is disruptive may be seeking needed attention. So we have the least method of progressive disciplinary action. First time, leave it alone. Second time, make eye contact with the student. Third time, take action with the student. Fourth time, stop the class. And last, terminate the student. These are your formal disciplinary actions. You record the date and the behavior whenever class must be interrupted to manage behavior. Jot that down in your attendance notes or on a separate sheet of paper so you have that just in case you need it. Keep your documentation in a secure location. Draft a memo to the student detailing their disruptive behavior. Send a copy to the chief, manager, and training officer. Await formal action by the training division. Once you've taken those actions, let the training division handle it from that point forward. So why is it important for instructors to manage student behavior in the classroom? Disruptive students are going to cause other students not to learn. Okay. Anybody from the webinar? Keep the class flowing. Leah, good job. Anybody else? All right, moving on. In summary, an effective instructor must be an effective communicator. Interpersonal communications and effective public speaking are the first skills that the instructor should cultivate. These skills are included in effective lecturing, using audiovisual aids, and transitioning between parts of a lesson. Instructors should understand the fire and emergency services. They are required to emphasize mastery of skills and criterion reference testing. They must also learn effective questioning techniques, how to lead a class discussion, and how to facilitate structured exercises during lessons. They should also be familiar with alternative forms of education instruction, such as computer-based training. Effective instructors must make adjustments to classroom instruction for students' learning abilities, behavior, and personalities. Addressing individual student needs requires time management in the classroom, counseling skills, and coaching. In addition, instructors must manage disruptive students to ensure that such students do not hinder the learning of others. 
and we've wrapped up chapter number six.